The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. So thrilled to be here with you on this Friday morning, June 7th. I don't know where the time goes. We're going to be talking with you for the next two hours about autism from a 360-degree perspective, and we're going to talk about play and how we're, we're coping with different things that come up on this spectrum, whether it's that you yourself are on the spectrum or you're working with a child as a teacher or a parent or a practitioner. We want to help you to hook you up with information that is relevant to what's happening for you. There's so much information about autism. I always love talking to people about the fact that, you know, I host this show and that it's two hours live uh, Monday through Friday, and people always say the same thing. Is there really that much to talk about with autism? You know, it, it turns out that there really is. <laughs> and so, and we want to, we, we really try here and we're trying even more to stretch out the topics in which we cover so that we look at autism from that 360 degree perspective, because it's a different journey for everybody on this way. So if we're not hitting topics that you want to talk about, it's only because you haven't told us. That's why, that's exactly why. So if there are things that you want us to be talking about, I hope that you'll reach out to us. Emily is going to show you all the different ways that you can currently get in touch with us here and all the different ways that you can currently watch the show because there are many different platforms that we're on so that we hopefully hit a time and a spot where all of you can watch and by the way the show is free in all the different aspects that you can watch it so I hope you'll write in call in and definitely watch and share with other people that if you meet other parents you meet other teachers practitioners that you let them know hey you know check out autism live whether they want to watch the whole show or just topics that are on our YouTube channel. We try to make it accessible for everyone. And if there's some way that would help you to watch it, oh, let us know. Um, I also want to remind you there's only one way to watch us live. That's at www.autism-live.com. When you go there, there's a white box. And you can type your questions, suggestions, comments into that white box. We're leaving it open 24 hours a day, seven days a week right now. So you hit enter and it will show up magically here on my screen. So the next time we're here in the studio and I, if it's a question that clearly requires an expert, which somebody had written in night before last, that clearly requires an expert. And I've got two, count them two. It's like that doublement commercial from years ago. Two experts uh, in the field of autism that are going to be joining us later on today. <coughs> Excuse me. And then and we have the opportunity to ask them your questions. You can keep those questions coming in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But two hours a day, Monday through Friday, we break into that, that feed that's running and we're here live. So it's that instant gratification aspect, which we all kind of appreciate, I think. Okay, I also want to remind you at the start of the show that nobody on this show gives child-specific advice. There's a very good reason for that. It's a disservice to our kids. Our kids are individual, and, you know, I mean, we'd all love to have that thing where we can just, you know, stick a, uh, a card in and get the perfect advice about what to do with our children. It's not going to work that way for any of our kids because our kids are specific and the circumstances are specific. But we do uh, have the opportunity to have experts come in and give general advice and general questions for you to be asking and directions to go to help you to progress. Really want to hook you up to information and resources because, you know, those are the two most powerful things that we can have if there is an individual with autism in our lives, right? Information and resources. Gotta love it. Okay. And always reminding you at the start of the show that I am not an expert in autism. Oh, wish I were, but <laughs> I'm not. I'm a mom. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. 
half. He is in a completely included neurotypical fourth grade class, getting ready to graduate from that and move on to his fifth grade. And I know that that would not have happened if I had not had access to information and resources. I had the right people at the right time say, hey, this is what's going on with your child. Here's where you need to go. Here's who you have to talk to. Here's how you're going to fund it. And I'm forever going to be paying that forward. And I hope that uh, I can help you. My, my sort of mantra every morning is, please let me help at least one person to save at least five minutes and five dollars. If we can do more than that, woohoo, right? Um, but if I can save you five minutes and five dollars, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And that's really what I want to do. So tell me how I can help you to do that. I want to be of help to you. I have a huge karmic bill to pay because my son got access to great things. And it wasn't because I had it together. It wasn't because I could afford it. It wasn't because I was so smart. Ooh, no, none of those things. I just plain lucked out. So maybe it's that I want to help you to get luckier. That's what I want to do. Uh, and we all can. And this journey can be very rewarding if we're willing to look at it in certain ways. All right. Without further ado, every morning we like to share with you the jargon of the day. That's right. The jargon du jour, where we take one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we try to figure out what in the hey nani nani are the experts talking about? What are they, what are they meaning when they say, oh, we need to work on X, Y, Z with your child? Or if you're an individual on the spectrum and somebody says, oh, you know, you're having an issue with, what does that mean? Whatever it is. So we take the phrase, the word, the acronym, and we give you an actual definition and then we give you a working definition. It's not as exact. Let's be honest about that in case any of you are watching and you are experts in autism and it gives you hives. Um, but we need to have a place to start so we can start stacking up these words and get a big understanding of what's going on. So today's phrase is symbolic play. Now I will tell you when I was a child, I never differentiated between the kinds of play. And as a mom and as a teacher, I, uh, cause I taught older, uh, individuals, I wasn't thinking in these terms, but once somebody pointed these out to me and I could look and go, okay, wait a second. My son is very strong at, you know, functional pretend play, but the symbolic play, I need to put some things in motion so that he can jump to this because it's an important skill for him to have for a a lot of different reasons. Okay, so let's take a look at our actual definition. Our actual definitions for symbolic play is endowing objects with other qualities to play with them in socially relevant and, uh, and appropriate ways. Okay, what does that mean? Let's go to our working definition, using imagination to turn an object into a functional toy. So we talked a little bit about, and, and I'm going to have Dr. Nadowski come in and really explain these things to you, but just to give you a rough outline, we talked a little bit about functional pretend play. That's when you get the, the kitchens and you're playing with the food and stuff. And then we talked about imaginative play where you're making something out of nothing, right? The, the child says, oh, you know, I'm, I'm drinking out of a teacup and they're imagining and creating that this is a teacup. It's air. There's nothing there and they're making it up, right? Symbolic play is when they take something else, here's my mouse, and they turn this into a car. They're going to endow this and they're going right? They're making this into something that it's not because they're using that imagination. And now this little thing becomes a little car. Uh, it's a very important, um, level of play. Um, it's going to help our children with a whole bunch of skills later on, and it's going to help with flexibility issues. And there are lots of ways we can work on this. I'm not going to go into those because I'm not the expert, but we do have an expert who's joining us in just a few minutes, and she will be breaking down all the different types of play um, so that you can really understand it and talking about how we teach these things because it's a great thing to hit in the summer. You know, we don't, we don't want to spend the whole time in the summer um, ever working on things that the child does not find interesting. And in fact, the things that they don't find interesting, we have to find a way to make them reinforcing, either by a reward or making the thing in and of itself interesting. And what the main thing we need to remember with our kids with play is that we have an expectation that they're going to find play pleasurable. Well, that's not an accurate way of looking at things because sometimes they don't. We need to help them to find play pleasurable. 
And then when they do, it will help them with lots of other skills. It's great stuff to work on the summer. I mean, it's great to work on it all year long, but particularly in the summer when you got a little bit of time and you want to do something extra fun, why not get those play skills up and running so that then they can work on them in the context of it being a social experience? Woohoo! right? That would be awesome. Okay. So, uh, again, we'll talk with Dr. Nadowski a little bit more, but that's, you know, a sort of a basic understanding of symbolic, really important skills for later on. Uh, all right. We always have a question of the day for you. Um, and we hope that you participate on Facebook. We love it when you do. Our question today is, what are your greatest concerns about the way your child engages in play? Because sometimes, and I know some of you are going to write in and say, my child only plays by themselves. Others of you are going to say, um, you know, they're very bossy or they won't play with another child, which is the playing by themselves. Um, if they're inflexible, but Write all those things in because I guarantee you somewhere out there there's a parent or an individual who's on the spectrum who needs to hear what you've had to say about your child uh, so that they know that they're not alone. There are lots of different things. Uh, my son, one of the goals that we have for him that we've written into his IEP for next year is to persevere with playing with peers because we have had a rule that he needs to, you know, go up to at least three friends on the playground during lunch and recess and ask them to play. And he is doing that. But uh, there was a day not too long ago where his two best buddies at school weren't there. Right. Uh, so he, you know, went and asked total strangers and they just kind of ignored him and he didn't persevere. So my greatest concern is and it's a little bit of that social language thing that when there's a breakdown and when the conversation isn't working, like he'll walk up to somebody and say, hey, do you want to play with me? And they ignore him. And he goes, OK, I tried. Um, but it's that fix repeat pairing conversation of, and persevering and realizing, okay, I don't know if they heard me. So, you know, putting himself in a position physically, making eye contact with them, saying their name, saying, Hey, Lamaya, you know, uh, I, I, I want to know if you want to play with me seeing and, and persevering. So that's one of my concerns for my child, um, because he'll try a couple of things and then he, says, ah, I'm going to go play by myself, which, you know, there needs to be a line at which you go, okay, it's not going to work out today. Right. But I think he's given up too early. So that's my current concern with my child. Um, back in the early days, the only thing that my child did, the first thing that when, uh, you know, people were saying to me, what's he doing that's, that doesn't seem appropriate to you that you think you might have autism. He would have his little play figures that he would play with. They were like those, uh, Mattel heroes. And he, you know, so he'd have the two heroes and, he, and the way he had them talk because he'd lost all of his ver verbal language, he would go <laughs> and talk like that. And that, it was very strange to me. Uh, so that was my concern way long time ago. That's certainly not my concern now. Now, you know, he's sort of past the action figure age, but if he's playing with another child, he's got them and he's like, hey, do you want to go over to the barn and do this? Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, totally typical. Uh, but that's a little, that's a little baby now, mom, uh, he tells me, which is also incredibly typical. So, uh, you know, how far have we come? Really, really amazing. I'll look forward to seeing what you guys write in and hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that. And even if there are some um, big concerns, maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about that with our experts that are going to be joining us. Now, we also always have a topic of the week and I've already given it away by this point, usually and I have today, it's play skills. We're talking about play skills. It's one of those things that it's all too easy to poo-poo and say, you know, we need to get language going because if we don't get language going, you know, I, I, my fears for my child. And of course, we always want to get functional communication on board first thing, right? And we need to get compliance on board first thing. And as we're prioritizing and saying, okay, well, here's what I want to work on. And, you know, play is going to be the last thing. But keep in mind that, a, you've got to vary things up, right, um, in order to keep it interesting. Nobody wants to be bored. You and I don't, for sure, and our kids don't. So 
Uh, and we always need to make things reinforcing. But when a child has limited play skills, they have limited things that are reinforcing to them. And what I saw very clearly is that at the same time that they were teaching my child compliance, at the same time that they were teaching him eye contact skills, they were teaching him functional communication and manding, they were working on play skills with him so that things were very reinforcing to him. Because down the road, when we would get into things that were more complex and more difficult, he had the promise of, you know, you do this five times and then you can go play. And he knew exactly what that was and he wanted to do it. So, and I've always say too on the show that when our kids have play skills, they have a forum in which to work on things that are more complex that's safe that they can go and do the sociodramatic play with their friends and pretend that they're, you know, the dad or they're the fireman or whatever, and they can take on other people and say things. And if they get it wrong, the other kids might laugh a little bit, but they're still accepted because it's play. It really, I think, is so beneficial on so many different fronts, and it gives them an opportunity to work on social skills and language skills and everything under the sun. So play skills don't don't put them at the back of the line. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. And lots of exciting things going on today in the studio. Let's take a look at some of the different things we have in just a little while. We're going to be joined by Dr. Adele Nadowski for real progress with Dr. Adele. Of course, it's Friday. So we try to give you a funding tip on Friday. Really important because if you don't have the money, how do you afford anything else that there is to do on this journey? I hate it that it comes down to money, but a lot of times it does. It's, you know, it's the grown up thing. I always say you got to put on your big girl pants and face the truth. It comes down to money sometimes. Uh, and then later in the next hour, we will be joined by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox for research with Dr. Jonathan. And we'll talk about a wide variety of things with Dr. Tarbox, including play and the, the question that somebody had written in night before last. So all of that and more here on Autism Live today. And of course, we'll throw everything else, not the experts, but everything else away to answer your questions as you send them in. And I hope that you will. So we're going to take a break, stick with us, and we'll be back with more after these messages. Hi guys, welcome back. For the month of June, I figured we'd do some cool things that are kind of like summer camp activities. So the activity we're doing this month is making a shoebox guitar. The materials you'll be needing are an old shoebox, a paper towel roll, a pencil, a stencil, rubber band, a crayon, and an X-Acto blade, which only the adults will be using. So first things first, I have a shoebox and I painted it just so it's a little bit more interesting. This is an opportunity for your kids to decorate however they choose. They can keep it simple or do some stripes with paint, or you can always use, you know, stickers or tape instead of paint to decorate it. All right, now that I have this, I'm gonna take my stencil, place it on top of the shoebox, and I'm gonna draw a circle somewhere in the center, okay? So now that I have that, I'm gonna take my X-Acto blade, which is why this is for the adults, and cut out the circle. Next, we're gonna cut out a smaller circle at the top of our shoebox guitar. The reason we're going to do this is so that we have a place to insert our paper towel roll, AKA the stem of the guitar. And I'm gonna grab my paper towel roll and I'm gonna trace the outside of this so I can cut a hole on the top of this too to stick this in so it just looks a lot more realistic. It won't be usable, but it'll look pretty cool. Now that it's been traced, now I'm gonna cut it out with X-Acto blade. And again, this is something that only the adults should be doing. Now that I have both of the holes cut in this, I'm gonna take my guitar strings and place them on. As you can see, it's missing one thing. It's stem, so now I'm gonna put this in the hole we just cut out. All right, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my crayon and put this in. And then after that, your guitar is totally done and you're ready to rock out with your kids. And if you're really cool, you'll make another one so you and your child can play together while doing sociodramatic play or work on imitation skills where you play a pattern on here and then they try to repeat it. I hope you and your child had lots of fun making this. And until next time, rock on. Can you see me flying by your side? 
Welcome back to Autism Live. It's time for our funding tip of the week. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about how you fund this journey. And I know that everybody's got different circumstances and we're starting in different places. We've asked you to participate and make sure that you are, you can find it on our Facebook to uh, make your voice be heard for the representatives and senators in the state of California about new legislation that would rule out regional centers paying for co-pays. Uh, for those of you who have autism insurance reform, which is the best of all circumstances, we know it's still hard and that you're struggling with your co-pays. Um, there are organizations such as the Regional Center that are currently helping families to be able to do that. So we're asking for everybody to write in. It is on our Facebook page. You'll have to scroll down because it was posted a week ago uh, where you can call in or write in or email in to those people to let them know that this is not acceptable. We Families need help with this. Um, I would also tell you that if you're in a state that does have regional center, there are alternatives for you for copay. I, I really hope and pray that everyone within the sound of my voice, if you if the copay portion of what you're struggling with is what's sinking your battleship, because you could have access to thirty, forty, a hundred thousand dollars worth of treatment, but you have to have a copay of five thousand dollars that you have to pay before you can do that, and it's stopping you. I really want to talk to you about all the different things that you can do to combat that, but don't let it stop you from getting what your child needs. That's the main thing that I, I main message that I want to send out to you. And for those of you who don't yet have insurance reform and you're saying, I don't, I don't know what to do. Of course, I always remind you that there's IBT, which is training that you can do so that you yourself can be uh, up on what you need to do to help your child. And skills is a great resource for the curriculum. Uh, there are smaller costs attached to both of those things. And sometimes that can be outside of a family reach. We talk about all different kinds of places to get grants and you can watch some of our other shows to see about those. I'll remind you about Act Today and the United Healthcare Children's Fund. But um, from time to time, I talk about having a fundraiser and somebody had written in this week and said, I, you talk about that, but it makes me uh, feel horrible at the idea of asking my friends and family to donate and asking my community to donate because it feels like a failure. And I'm so glad that you wrote that in and said that because I can really relate to that. And I think that many people out there can relate to that as well. I, I can give you my experience that uh, somebody had said to me, you, you need to have a fundraiser. And I was very reticent about it because it felt like a failure. And, and then a very wise person said to me, don't stand in the way of your child's progress because of your personal pride. Uh, right? <laughs> uh. Um, and, and they said, and don't prevent other people from the pleasure of being able to be a part of your journey and to help you. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> so my husband and I, we did, we had a fundraiser. And then a little bit later on, friends of ours had a fundraiser for us that we didn't know anything about. Now, I think that both of those things are really viable and, uh, I would encourage you to let people in your community know if you're struggling. It's okay. You didn't plan on autism. There wasn't like a dance card that said, oh, and by the way, autism will be coming on this day. You need to be financially prepared. And remember, you could have worked really hard and you still couldn't have been able to afford autism. If Holly Robinson Pete says nobody can afford autism, then we all get to forgive ourselves because we don't have that money in our bank account. Then we can forgive ourselves and we can move on to what are the solutions that we can do so that our child or our teenager or or a young adult doesn't miss out on opportunities that are available to them. And one of the things that you can do, there are churches. If you are involved in a church, make sure that you let somebody in the church know and say, hey, we're struggling. Be very clear about what would be helpful. If it's equipment or money or time, you know, somebody to do respite, be very clear about what would help you. And if it's all of those things, be clear about that and be willing to take what comes into you. You know, you 
never know what's going to come back to you. I said yesterday that when we did our fundraiser, one of the people who gave very generously was Esther Williams, and she passed away yesterday. But I forever will have such warm, wonderful, uh, fabulous things to say. I loved her before that, let's be honest. But, you know, did I know that Esther Williams was going to donate for my child's fund? I did not. When we said, okay, we're going to hold a little fundraiser, I had no idea that Esther Williams was going to say, let me write a check. Uh, so you don't know what's going to come in from where and, and open your heart and your mind to being appreciative. But there are all kinds of groups that exist out there that are just the main purpose of them. They're social groups, but they're also there to help and support. You know, you drive down a main street in any town and you'll see a Kiwanis club or you'll see the Knights of Columbus or uh, the Order of Elks, right? Uh, all these organizations for, uh, there's the, in my community, there's the Seroptimist Club. Um, there are organizations all over the place and they love to find a place where they can make a difference. They're sororities and fraternities. They're supposed to be active and doing something for a community. Then uh, we, we had people on the show last week that talked about part of a bar mitzvah is to do the mitzvah, to do something that helps someone else. So when you put it out there and say, I could use some help, there are people who are thrilled to come and say, here's what we can do. Um, I know, and we've talked about it here before on the show, that when we do something nice for someone else, it makes us feel better on all different fronts. So don't jip somebody out of that opportunity to do something nice for you so that they feel better. Think of it in that way. It is not that you are a failure. You are not a failure. You are doing the hardest work that I know of. So let other people help you, though, and help spread the joy. It is amazing what happens, and I've shared before on the show, when we did our first fundraiser. Um, it was amazing to me because I was feeling a little like, oh, I'm a little embarrassed about this. And yet everyone who attended our fundraiser came up and said, thank you. As I was trying to say thank you to them, they said, no, thank you, because we adore you, we love you, and we have not known what to do. If I have another friend and there is a death in the family, I know what to do. But when a child is diagnosed with autism, I don't know what to do for you. So I needed to show up for you in some way. And the way that people show up, it's amazing. Uh, you know, it's all different things, and we have no judgment, but it was really one of the most affirming moments in my life that night because of people saying thank you because I needed this. I needed to be a part of this. And then we updated people on a regular basis and said, here's what's happening. Here's, you know, your donations. Here's what has happened as a result of that. And they were thrilled with the updates. So don't get in your own way. It's my, my lesson to you. And if you need more help about coming up ideas with what the fundraiser would look like or what organization to go to, feel free to message me directly here at the show. Uh, you can talk to me on Facebook, you can on our Facebook page, on my personal Facebook page, or you can send it to the uh, info at autism hyphen live. Is it autism live at gmail.com? Uh, yes, I know the email address. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break, and then I believe we are going to have real progress with Dr. Adele Nadowski. So stick with us. You say hi. Hi, you're back at Autism Live. I'm Lisa Ackerman, and you're at the Allergy Friendly Cooking Show. And we have kind of an interesting surprise. I've brought my sister. That's surprise number one. Yeah. The yeah. fact that I came is surprise number two. I know, two. right? Hi, Jamie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing one of my favorite recipes, an ode to Sue, a taco super mom. She created a kid-friendly sushi recipe for her son, Zach. So, hi, Zach. Thanks for allowing us to borrow your lunch recipe because it's really awesome. So, we can't wait to show it to you. First, what I'm gonna do, we're gonna cut up some of these things so we can get ready. I'm gonna take an organic cucumber and just make some slices of this that we're gonna use in a little bit to add um, some extra textures to the seaweed roll that we're going to do. And I'm just making long slices so we can place this in our sushi later on. And then I got, of course, a nitrate-free, gluten-free, fantastic sausage. Love this. So this is a barbecue chicken that we had last night. It was pretty awesome. Make sure that I have a little bit of everything here for 
the sushi roll. So now let's make the sauce. Use my gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free soy sauce. And um, of course, my most favorite thing in the world is crushed ginger. I love this stuff. I thought that was garlic at first. No, you can actually I didn't know you'd do. Buy it that way. This ginger is just such a blessing for digestion. So I just made this quick sauce, super easy. So here's my cooked rice. This rice is very, very sticky. I used this really great little water and um, apple cider vinegar combination just to keep my hands. That's what the sushi chefs do is a little trick, which is like pretty good. Use for apple cider. Vinegar. I know, and I love so that stuff. So good for you. So all I'm doing is just keeping my fingers a little bit damp so the rice doesn't stick to my fingers. And we're just pushing this all through. If your kids don't like green, not a problem. You just flip it over. So that way we can hide the green stuff from our kids and it will be rice out as part of the recipe. So let's have a little fun. We're going to do my favorite, avocado. And if you're sending this uh, to lunch with your kids, um, you may want to put a little extra of the lemon on there because it, it will get brown. And I even have sensory issues for the brown stuff. So there we go. There's our avocado. So the next thing I'm going to do is do a couple of the oh, cucumbers. I know. It's so easy and it's so cute and we're going to eat healthy. Yay! Make one for me for lunch today, yes, right? you can have one for lunch. Now comes the fun stuff, the sausage. So you could put anything in here. Anything. Jeez. Anything. It's really just the simplest thing in the entire world. And then, so, you know, it's sushi kids can eat. And I'm not, I wasn't joking about that. So I may squeeze a little more extra lemon on there. And now I'm going to take my little sausage, or sauce, kiss me. Just put a little bit on there so we're coating. About a oh, teaspoon. So Doesn't it look good? <laughs> you can get this at any cooking food store. So this is just the little sushi roller, which I think is fun. So I'm going to put this underneath. And I'm going to start to roll. So you got to watch how you go through and roll this. So the biggest thing is to try to get it compacted enough. So when all is said and done, wow. we can hide the green stuff. So again, with um, cutting sushi, you want to make sure your knife's really sharp. And um, we also want to get it a little wet because that way it would make it easier for cutting. So I'm going to just cut off the ends. It's so funny. These are our taster bites, Jamie. You can tell me how these taste. Go ahead and try it. Yum. I know, right? See? And your body kind of goes, wait, I'm waiting for seafood. But you've got awesome sausage, chicken. You've got a full serving of vegetables. And yeah. is that good? Yeah. Yum? You're not lying? You're not lying? OK, good. I like more sauce. You like more we sauce? We can even put wasabi in there if we like Yeah, it. if, you know, I think the wasabi, the issue. Oh, we're making it for kids, sorry. Yeah, we are making it for kids. This is just a fun way to introduce more foods to your kids and notice they're eating seaweed. We'd love to hear from you. If you have an idea or you want us to convert a recipe, let us know. Jamie, thanks for being my Thank you for fabulous plan of white. Um, you can reach us at autismlive at gmail.com or Facebook, facebook.com slash autismlive. Or we have thousands of recipes on Taka Now. So, you know, go check out the Taka website and let's get cooking. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get right, let's get right, let's get right. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are here with Dr. Adele Nadowski because it's time for Real Progress with Dr. Adele. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. It's always a thrill to have you here. Thank you. And I want to talk to you today about play skills. That's been our focus awesome. all this week. And, you know, I've done a rudimentary thing of talking about the different areas, but I, we wanted an expert to talk to us about play skills. And most importantly, after we talk about what they are, how do we teach them? Okay. Because, you know, I think that can be a little overwhelming to right, us as right. parents. If kids don't automatically, I mean, we have an expectation that they're just automatically going to play and that they're going to love it. <laughs> and that's not the case with our kids. Just a lot of no. times they, you know, you hand a child to a, uh, to, uh, a toy to a child with autism and they find it aversive, they don't like it, or uh, it's just boring. Yeah, one of the characteristics of autism is that they engage in these ritualistic and stereotypical behaviors and a lot of times that 
is demonstrated through the way they interact with the toys. Yes. So people will say they line up their objects or they took the car and they just spun the wheels over and over again, yeah. but they didn't actually play correctly with the toys. Yeah, and our kids love trains, but so often you go to a home where a child has uh, an autism spectrum disorder and they're laying down sideways watching the train go around instead of picking up the cars and doing things with them. Yes. So uh, what are the different play skills that we work on and um, and how do we teach them? Oh man, there's tons of play skills. Um, did you want to talk about one in particular? Like were we talking about pretend play today or are we talking about everything? Well, I, we, we kind of did an overview, a uh, brief overview of functional pretend play uh, versus imaginative play versus uh, symbolic play okay. and sociodramatic play. Okay. Um, and I hopefully I did a good job of that. So I guess, you know, an overview of like maybe why they're so important and how you could, t an example of how you could teach each one of those. Okay. So um, with functional pretend play, just to review, that's teaching the child to use uh, toys as their intended purpose. So for example, if it's a car, they're going to actually move it and drive it and they're going to make sounds that go along with it like vroom vroom and that kind of stuff. Um, and for symbolic play, now they're not necessarily using a car, but they're using a block that's like a similar shape to a car and pretending that it's a car. Right. So the block is symbolic of a car mm -hmm. or symbolizes a car. And then um, imaginary would be maybe they don't even have all of the objects. So maybe they have like a sword um, and they're pretend fighting with somebody who's there but not really there. It's all imagination. Okay. Um, and then sociodramatic would just be if they have um, taking roles. Okay. So that could be with the dolls, like they could have little dolls that are talking and they're taking roles, or it could be with other children who are dressing up and they're each playing a role and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, usually when you're starting off teaching uh, play skills, you start off with imitation. Ah. So um, teaching children to be able to imitate is a very important skill because it's necessary for teaching many, many other things, one of which is play skills. Yeah. So um, one of the things you can do is you can start off with the car and tell the child um, something like do this, and then you can do vroom, vroom, vroom. And if they already have a history of knowing how to imitate, it'll be very simple for them to learn. Okay. You could then drop the do this and then just start um, doing it and then prompting them to follow. And you can start chaining it then. So you start with just, you know, a car doing this, but now maybe he's jumping over something. And okay. then they're literally side by side with you with the same identical toys. Okay. Kind of watching and just following along with everything that you're doing. Okay. And it becomes a longer play interaction than just one little quick thing. Fascinating. Because, you know, that, that wouldn't even occur to me. Okay. Um, but... An important component I'm imagining is not just saying do this and having them do it, but then reinforcing the fact that they did it. You have to do that, of course. Yeah, because yeah. the actual play itself is probably yeah. not fun for them initially. Right. It's like work. Um, but it's something that can become fun. Right. Um, and some people might say, well, then why are you teaching him to play? Like, isn't play supposed to be fun? So who cares if he plays? Right. Um, but there's so many other things that you learn through play. Like you're working on your fine motor skills a lot of times. Yeah. Um, picking up little small objects and manipulating them, Legos, you know, beating, whatever it may be. Um, you're working on your uh, perspective taking skills when you're doing mm -hmm. the role play. If you have two dolls and one saying one thing and one saying another, you're actually kind of engaging in perspective taking at this point. Right. Pretend play is an extremely, um, it's like a precursor skill to perspective taking. Mm -hmm. Um, being able to even understand that there are two different roles and that everything I'm experiencing is different from what this person's experiencing. Yeah. So, um, and I think it's some kind of, of the, the functional, excuse me, I, I think of some of the functional pretend play and, and that has the ability to help learn adaptive skills later on too, because, you know, the, uh, there's the little pretend vacuum cleaner and the pretend broom and the kids are practicing yeah. doing things that are adaptive skills that you're going to work on later on. It's a great and let's not forget what are their peers doing and we want yeah. them to fit in and we want them to have friends and yeah. the way that they do that is through play dates and yes. going to preschools and playing and right. if they don't play and they just sit off on the side they're viewed as kind of like the oddball out right. and that's not going to be very helpful. Yeah. So so super duper important. Okay, so for the so we we can imitate and we can do that with all of the things. We could do that with functional pretend play. We can do it with symbolic play. We can do it imaginative play. Yeah. We can do it with sociodramatic. Then we can also instruct. So um, mm -hmm. we can have materials and we can tell the child um, something like you know. 
um, give the baby a bath or something like that mm -hmm. if they're at that level. Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't know how to give a baby a bath, then we're going to imitate. And then yeah. we're going to fade out the modeling. And then now they're just going to be able to do it when you say give the baby a bath. Okay. And then eventually you're going to fade from very specific instructions telling them what to do to how to play to let's play dolls. And they actually know what that means because they've done enough activities with dolls yeah. before to where they can just get out the dolls and start playing. And that's more natural of what's going to happen with peers is that they're going to be playing with a peer and the peer is going to say, let's play house. Yes. Let's play you know, whatever the yeah. topic is or something. And, and typically we, I think we've talked about this before that you have them play with you before they, we try to get them to play with the peer, right? Yeah. Typically just to get a few skills under their belt. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've also done it where I bring a peer in and, um, if you get the right peer who's really enthusiastic and likes to help, they have a good time. Um, when you tell them we're going to help um, yeah. Joey here, learn how to play better. It's going to be super fun. Come over. And then plus you have something set up to do like today's going to be tea party. Tomorrow's going to be, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you have these things set up and they walk in and they're just like, yeah, this is fun. Yeah. And then, um, you can have, you can actually prompt the peer to prompt the child. So you yes. would say something to the peer, like tell her do this and then, and then yeah. they'll do it because yeah. they're excited about it. And then of course, at the end, everyone gets a little goody or something. So yeah. they want to keep coming. Absolutely. And I've done that before with recurring play dates of a peer coming over to help facilitate the play. Yeah. And it doesn't take long before you can start implementing that. It's not like they need to be completely 100% solid and they know how to play with everything before you're bringing a peer in. You can Very bring cool. them in pretty soon thereafter once they're able to imitate and follow simple instructions. Okay. And I, and you guys gave uh, us this advice and I've heard it with other people too, that often the little girls are, and you don't use this word, but I'm going to bossy. I was just uh, thinking that. <laughs> the bossy little girls. We just had my grandniece visiting and she's five years old neurotypical. I have never, I love that little child for all she's worth, but she was such a bossy so-and-so. And it is that thing. I'm sure I was too at five. Um, and she just ordered him around like a drill sergeant. And it was fascinating to see because when it was something he wanted to do, he, he, my son did it with her. And other times he would say, no, Ellie, I'm not doing that, which I loved that he stuck up for himself. But early on, you know, getting that play date with the bossy girl is very That's beneficial. exactly what we did. We had a little girl, we were teaching how to do play skills and we found the bossy actually what I did is I went to her preschool uh -huh. and I observed and uh -huh. I watched all the kids uh -huh. and I looked to see how does my child play right okay and I kind of saw what she does um, it was good because she was at least in the vicinity of the other children right um, not like off sitting in the corner or something. Right. And then I watched how the other children played and I looked for two things one was a peer who would interact with her yeah and found her someone they wanted to talk to and be with but two was also very bossy. Yeah. And, and it, when I found that peer, we approached the family and asked if they would do it. And they said, sure, no problem. And, and I'm sure they're thrilled. Recurring play dates. I'm sure that they're thrilled because, you know, to have that bossy thing be something that's really incredibly beneficial, it's like, yeah. woohoo, my kid can help another kid. Yay. That's a right. wonderful thing. Yeah. Uh, fabulous. But very important that we work on play skills. Yeah. I, I know I had it last on my list and I know a lot of other parents who poo poo it and say I, I got to work on on all these other things first and I'll worry about play skills and I, I I think I've learned from you and others that integrate it into the full program would you say yeah okay and if you think about it too if they know how to play it also gives them some leisure activity they can do by themselves independently because otherwise what are they doing they're engaging in stereotypy or they're um, kind of doing nothing or they're following you around getting in your way when you're trying to get things done so for them to be able to have activities and one thing you can do is set up little play stations yep. and start to teach them independent play as well using a timer so we're going to sit here and you're going to do blocks for a little while like once they have it a repertoire of different things they are, know how to play and mm -hmm. do set up stations, set a timer, and when they finish, um, they can go on to the next station and they get a reinforcer. Yeah. And the other thing is, is that you begin to teach them also, like, maybe if they are going to do an activity schedule, you can have pictures of all the stations and they can learn to come up with their own schedule yeah. and they can learn to complete something and take it off the book right. as it's complete. They learn to take the materials out. So it's kind of a little bit of planning that yeah. goes on and put it together or do whatever it is. And then when they're done, they learn to clean up 
Right. So that's a very important skill, learning to tidy up and clean up after yourself. So and think about... You, there's think, so many skills involved. Yeah. And think about all of the, the problems that solves for you. Because I know parents who say, I don't have time to go to the restroom because I can't leave my child alone. Uh, when they're playing independently, doing something and safely, and they find it reinforcing, you, you, you're free to you know move about the cabin, as I like Plus, to say. Plus, you're improving their sustained attention abilities. Absolutely. They need to be able to sustain attention when they get to class. When yep. they go to preschool, eventually, they're going to have to sit in a circle time for sometimes like 20 or 30 minutes. I've seen some long circle times yep. before. Yep. And um, if they can't do anything for more than 30 seconds, then they're not going to be able to hang. And, and how about all the parents who write into us who have the teenagers who say, my child only wants to do one thing. They want to play on the computer, you know? And when we build these skills in earlier, then we, we have a child who has more varied interests. Yeah. And I don't... I, talk to us about, is it too late once they're a teenager to set up that kind of visual schedule and say, hey, you can only play the computer for an hour, and then you need to go outside and do this, and then you need to go to the pool? We can still do that with the older kids, yeah. can't we? Yeah. You can use that stuff and help them to even plan it themselves and make it more age-appropriate if you want, like a list if they can read or right. something on like an iPhone or something in Absolutely. a calendar, whatever. Um, but yeah, of course. And all of us still operate off of visual aids. Like, I have to use my phone to know what I'm doing in the next 10 minutes. That's, yes. <laughs> I think we're all there. We were saying the other day, what did we do before smartphone, smartphones? Um, okay. Uh, so... We are going to take a little bit of a break, and then okay. we're going to come back, and you're going to answer a question that has come in about skills. Okay, sounds good. All right, so stick with us more with Dr. Adele Nadowski after these messages. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides programs to educate students, parents, and professionals proven techniques using applied behavior analysis. Access online video lessons with IBT eLearning. Get one-on-one -on -one personalized instruction with IBT face-to-face -face training. Acquire professional guidance with IBT BCBA supervision. Develop professional growth with IBT continuing education courses. Get access to IBT services today. IBT 360 degrees of ABA training. Welcome back. We have to give a very special shout out to a viewer who has been watching our show faithfully and has actually been a guest on the show, Mr. Mike Hippel, who is watching us right now and who I understand has completed all of his schooling and graduated. Mike, we are so proud of you. I did get your book. And now that I know that you're watching for the summer, maybe on Monday, we'll take an opportunity to read your book on the show. But congratulations to Mike on graduating and finishing school. So, so proud of you. It's great work. Uh, but we have Dr. Adele Nadowski here with us, and she's going to talk to us about a question that has come in on skills because she is co-creator of skills and uh, I, the best authority that I know of to talk about things with skills. So what was the question that came in? <laughs> the question is um, whether or not there is training that people can get if they want to use skills or some sort of consultation. Um, so to answer that question, yes, we do provide that. Um, on a more basic level, the free options if you're using skills is that there's a live chat feature, and it's at the top of the page um, where it says live help. Just click it, and then you can begin live chatting. That's available 9 to 5 Pacific Standard Time. Um, you could also go to our support center link, which is on the bottom of every page, and you can email us or you can call us with your questions, um, and we will get back to you on that. Um, but Anything beyond that, when you start getting into questions that are very child specific, we'll recommend for you skills consultation and we can set you up with someone who is um, uh, very well trained on skills and has dealt with and uh, taught skills to many, many different children on the spectrum. And what they'll do is they'll set up monthly um, or weekly, however often you want, meetings and they'll do it through like a video conferencing or phone type of thing. and. Together, you can both log into the skills program and look at what's going on, and they can help kind of hold your hand through using the skills system with your child. Um, and then if you are more like an organization or a school setting and you just want your staff trained better on how to use skills, we can send someone out in person to do that. Um, and we have all sorts of packages on what we, what we deliver for that. Um, but one thing I also want to mention is that we have a partnership with the Institute for Behavioral Training. Um, it's an organization that provides training on how to implement ABA. So if you are using skills but you realize that you don't even know how to implement ABA techniques yet, then you could go to their e-learnings and you could uh, watch videos to find out how. 
um, but also they provide in-person trainings and they have some really cool ones. Some of them are very intensive, like 10 or 11 day trainings that happen here in LA. And actually I know they're doing one uh, very soon in South Carolina. Okay. And a lot of people travel from all over the world to go to these because it trains people on how to do more of like supervision of services for children with autism. And about 50% of what they're learning is uh, programming and curriculum development and how to use skills in those classes. Cool. So I love the fact that it's really so varied in terms of how you can do it, because I know there are some of you who are like, I'm not going to learn from video. I need to go and I need to have one on one and I need to get it in a lump sum and I need to do it now. Yeah. Right. And then there are other people like me that I couldn't have done that. I just couldn't have done that. My couldn't schedule, have traveled. Yeah. I couldn't have traveled. I wouldn't have known, you know, even going to a conference, I used to say, where is my child when I'm at this conference? I just, somebody explained that to me, you know, how is that working out? I just could never, I couldn't figure that out. I couldn't get there. I still struggle with that. Um, because I want to be, I, ex, I have an expectation. I'm with my child all the time. It, right. They need to flip that switch in my head. I don't know. <laughs> my son says, go, go away. <laughs> Leave me with somebody else. Would you please? And I, I'm like, no, I'm your mother. The umbilical cord only goes so far. And I saw he just turned 10 recently. 10! 10! I, like, he's I, practically uh, clo very college. close to being a teenager. <laughs> he's in college. I, and he's tall enough to be in college, I swear. Uh, but yes, the apron strings keep getting longer and longer. The umbilical cord gets longer. But my point is that it's it's suited for what individuals need because just like our kids are all individuals our circumstances are all individual our needs are all individual and basically what I hear all the time is you know say what you need and there's probably something that fits that and if there isn't they'll figure something out for your individual needs exactly but more than anything else when I started this journey there wasn't a way that a parent could just go and get trained that didn't exist right and that isn't the case anymore that is a myth of the past that you you know you're you're completely on your own and need to go to college and get a degree yeah. in it before you know what to do and you said something to me about that just stuck out to me that you wouldn't have been able to travel to attend a training but some people you also said don't necessarily learn through video yeah one option for that kind of person would be to do the videos but then also do the skills consultation over the phone model yeah. where someone can explain the concepts to you yeah and it can get to the level where they give you assignments and ask you to do certain yeah. things and then you send them videos and they give you feedback I mean it can happen you can do things at a long distance yeah. if you need to be empowered and know that there is a way you know whatever circumstance that you're in with your child whether you're close to an AB provider or you are in the Sahara Desert and you're not near anything, there's a way to make this work. Uh, smart individuals, much smarter than I, have been working on it for a long time to be able to make sure that there is something available to everyone. Uh, because you need, we need to be empowered as parents. And by the way, same thing goes for if you're an individual who's on the spectrum. You know, we've had people before write in and say, you know, I, I think maybe I'd like to work through the social curriculum myself, but I, I might need some consequences. Consultation. So, you know, that's We've done that before, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So uh, feel feel empowered to know that there are alternatives that are out there and they are person specific. Yes. Uh, which is an amazing thing. And I thank you for all the work that you've done to make that possible. Thank you. And I thank all of the people at CARD who were involved as well. Absolutely amazing. We couldn't have done it without you, them. You do good work. Don't start uh, crying. Uh, no, I, I, I'm trying not to well up. Uh, but, you know, that was one of my things early on was that I, my daily prayer was, how, how am I going to help my child? How am I going to help my child? I knew it was on me, right, <laughs> that I had to be doing something. How am I going to help my child? And then once we got started with CARD and we saw the difference in our child, and it was like, oh, how, how come everybody doesn't have the ability to do this? And so then it morphed into what are we going to do to make sure that everybody gets this opportunity. And then the first day that I, I met you and Dr. during Grandpa Shea on the same day for the first oh, time. Oh, at the focus group for yes, skills. Yes, they had a focus group for skills and they asked parents to come in and take a look at it and give their opinion and their feedback. And it was a life-changing day for me. because That was September of 2010, if you don't remember. I, I remember because I, you know why I remember? Because I went home and I wrote my Facebook status and I said, I've seen the future and it's amazing and I'm shaking with joy. And I guess Facebook somehow remembers that. And then it, it will say a year ago, Shannon said, right. right? And so it reminds me because I really think of it as a really life-changing day for me because 
I, I said it answered the second prayer. First card answered the first prayer, and then you guys answered the second prayer as well. Oh, this is how we're going to be able to make sure that everybody has access. Because it's unfair to me to think that I could just be lucky enough for my child to get help and that other people couldn't. Right. That's just not acceptable. So thanks. And you stood out to us at that training. That's why you're here today. I was very outspoken. Uh, I think I may have cried and I banged on the table a little bit and and said some really good feedback. Well, I was very excited. I did. I shook for two hours. I pulled away from the building and I had to pull in. There's a Ross just down the street. I had to pull in the parking lot and call my husband and say, I can't, I can't, I don't even know if I can drive home. I'm so excited. I can't, I can't wait to tell you what I saw today. That's how excited I was. That's cool. And it was, and you guys had, had shown us skills. I just thought it was amazing. And I have to say too, I use skills on a regular basis and I, I still am a fan. Uh, so thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Let's wax poet. Anyway, uh, we have to let you go because you have to okay. go back to helping families and children. And um, and we have a show to do. Uh, but in any case, we're going to take a short break and let Dr. Nadowski leave. But uh, in, in a few minutes, we're going to come back to one more segment. Then we're uh, after that, we're going to have Dr. Johnson in the tar box. So you're not going to want to miss that. Stick with us. Every child with autism deserves a bright future. Without further clarification, the Affordable Care Act could actually result in less benefits for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We urge Catherine Sebelius to clarify the Affordable Health Care Act. She can make one change, one little minor change, to make applied behavioral analysis be part of the health care plan. By signing this petition, you are protecting the health care benefits of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We need to make sure that we are heard and seen. Sign a petition at autism-live.com. Here's how you can show your infinite support. Create your own infinity ribbon. What you're going to do is take a ribbon that's been cut about 8 inches long, and you're going to grab one end and then twist it, and then take the two ends and join them together, and then take this together, and then I'm going to flip it around. I take another piece of tape, and what I have is double-sided sticky tape. Squeeze down. You have your very own infinity ribbon. With ABA. The possibilities are infinite. With ABA. The possibilities are infinite. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. With ABA, the the possibilities are infinite. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. diagnosed in 10 months since he started ABA and I don't think at the time we really understood that you can be happy fun and still have autism we were at Disneyland trying new foods and and he's open-minded to it eating was a nightmare a year ago and now it's not just in the last week we've noticed like huge differences in what he was willing to try uh, then versus what he's willing to try now you want to try a pair? Can you kiss it for a piece of cookie? Yeah. You want to kiss it? Yeah. Come here. Yeah. Up to a few months ago, you show the kid a banana and he would go nuts. <laughs> he ate it every day, but he didn't want to know that he was eating it. And a week ago, oh, yeah, she asked for it. Just ate it. Now he asks for him every day and he has a banana. I don't know what changed, but it just did. So good! Oh, that's so good. I wouldn't have even considered giving him a chewable vitamin six months ago. And I just hand it to him now and say he's got a chomp, and he knows that he has to crunch down on it. Good job! We're ecstatic about his development. I don't wake up every morning anymore thinking I have a child with autism. I just think I have two, two great kids. You've just been watching the A-Word. This is an amazing ongoing documentary being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I want to encourage you to go to their YouTube page and watch 
as many episodes as are relevant to you. Remember that you can search topics if you want to see Jack Riley being potty trained, if you want to see him starting preschool. Uh, there's more than two years worth of episodes in progress for you to take a look at. I think there are so many different op applications for this show. For those of you who are just starting out in ABA and you want to know what it looks like, what the arc of it, you realize that they're just small little snippets, but you can, as you watch, you do see the arc of what happens in ABA and how they take a very specific skill and they teach it and then it mushrooms into so many other different things uh, that really building blocks is the way to think of it that is you know they're building a staircase um, and you'll see them going through challenging behavior and um, this episode especially we see the payoff of all the work that they have done up until this moment because he found food aversive and we had said uh, a couple of weeks ago that when our kids are picky eaters sometimes hand in hand goes with that that their articulation is going to be slow to develop too, which makes it really difficult because we're hoping as soon as possible as we're giving them language skills, right, they want to be automatically reinforcing. We're going to reinforce them for speaking for a really long time, right? But we want to get it to the point where speaking is automatically reinforcing. When I say to somebody, I want to drink a water and they give me a drink of water, that reinforces the fact that I, you know, it's, uh, that I, it automatically reinforces it. So, but if a child says, and they're meaning I want a drink of water, but we can't understand because the articulation isn't there, then we say, what did you say? And the child gets frustrated, right? I don't know what they said, right? And all kids go through that phase, but we want to get the articulation, which means the oral motor. And oral motor skills, we can work on them in lots of different ways, but one of the ways that helps is when our child is chewing, right? Um, so we can pretend to chew. We can ask kids to pretend that they're chewing fake gum. Um, but when they're chewing, we're automatically going to be working those muscles several times a day, right? And it helps with the articulation. So uh, here we see that at this point, Jack Riley is eating a banana with no prompting, no extra reinforcement. We're just at that point where he can. And at the beginning of this series, when Jack Riley was eating it, it wasn't, he had to have it mashed up in his bowl and couldn't see the actual banana. If he saw the actual banana, he burst into tears. We don't know why. We may never know why. Probably we won't know why, but it's taken care of. That he's not going to cry at bananas anymore because they moved so slowly and so specifically. I think it's great to be able to see the progress that can happen when we're working in this way. For those of you who have kids who are further along on the spectrum uh, and you've been doing ABA for a while and many of you have written in recently and said, why are we not seeing progress? And we've talked a little with Dr. Uh, Dorian Grampache about that, about the fact that progress is important and if we're not seeing progress, it's time to change things. I hope you can take a look at these videos and see what quality ABA therapy looks like. It is not all at a table. It just isn't. Um, this child gets taken places. He goes places and has, and gets his skills worked on in all those different scenarios. And it, uh, it's not all at a table. So I, I hope that you take a look and, and say, okay, you know, I'm not seeing this kind of interaction. There are ones when you can watch them in clinic when they're discussing how he's doing with his supervisor, uh, where they're training therapists and you can see how all that works. And if you look at it and go, that's not happening in my program, be concerned. Be concerned and ask questions and consider, you know, moving to another ABA provider. And for those of you who have uh, family members who are saying, I don't get what you're doing. I don't understand why have you rearranged your life and you can't come to this wedding and you can't come to this because, you know, you're so busy and your life is so busy. I don't get it. Send them the link and say, watch what happens with this child over time. Would you do me a favor and watch that? I would try to explain because we didn't have the A word when I was doing this and I would try to explain and it's really hard. But if somebody gets a visual and understands, okay, that's what's happening. Uh, I think that you'll find that they get on board that much faster. My mom was really, she said, I don't understand what you're doing. And the first day that she came in our house when we were doing ABA and she would sit and watch on the video monitor with me, I, we had a little office space and I would cram her and I in there while the therapists were out in the living room working with Jem and she would watch and listen. And I would say, watch what they're doing now. And they're doing this. And she would say, why are they doing that? That makes no sense whatsoever. And I would say, watch mom, watch. And it took 
two days. And the second day, my mother went, this is the most amazing thing. I don't know why you don't have news crews in your home covering this, because this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Um, and I can't believe how much your child learned in the last 48 hours. This is exciting. And then she was on board. So I encourage you, if you've got the mother-in-law who goes, oh, I don't know, yeah, what are you doing? And, you know, he just did this and you need to punish him. But Have them watch the A word. Say, this is what we're doing. Climb on board. Be with us. It works. Uh, really beneficial. And we are getting ready to, we're working up to, we're going to be start to film in the coming months, an older child. We have heard you, our viewers who have said, we need to see what this looks like on a child who is not three. It's coming. I want you to know you have been heard. So uh, that that is in the works. We are going to take a break, though. After I encourage you one more time, go and watch the A-Word. Support them. Support that family. Amazing, amazing family. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by the fabulous Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. And he will be taking your questions. We have some that you guys have already written in. Uh, and I hope that you will continue to write in. Stick with us. When Maddie was diagnosed, I'll be honest, I was very ignorant on what autism was. I knew that autism was basically something that hit boys at the age of two to three and shut down. And sometimes you think of the typical Rain Man uh, movie. Um, and with Maddie, she was doing all the same signs and symptoms of a, of a typical child with autism spectrum disorder. Stand up. didn't even acknowledge us coming into the room. Um, she had barely any eye contact. Um, she didn't interact with her sister. She didn't really do anything. She just basically lined up her toys and that was about it. We have a team of seven volunteers, or, or eight now, we have eight volunteers, including my husband and I, and I'm the team leader, and so I do all the curriculum and get everything ready each week. Jana was downstairs until 11 o'clock at night working on curriculum, going through two different textbooks. And then we, as a group, meet on Monday nights, and we would go through what the curriculum was from Jana. And a lot of times we would go, well, how exactly do you do that? How do you sit her at the table and, and do this trial base? With what skills has done for us, it's, it's taken that away from Jana trying to figure out the curriculum for one, she can go down, or on our, even on our laptop, and she can sit down and through all these questions, it comes up with the different programs. At least for me, it was a relief off my shoulders. I was worried that I might be missing something, um, missing a curriculum that maybe she needs to know, where skills, they have every, every possible thing your child needs to know from zero to seven. They have a program for that. What noise is this? <laughs> Every program that we did with her, I knew it was specific for what she needed to learn. Because before skills, it was a lot of, okay, well, is that really age appropriate for a two-year-old? You know, because it's not generalized. It's anywhere from zero to seven. This is what your child needs to know in most, in most manuals you'll find. Um, but for this, okay, yep, yeah, she should be learning this. And no, she's not four yet. She doesn't need to know that yet. We are so fortunate that Jana was able to attend a conference put on by CARD that opened the door for skills and that um, there's no looking back for us. We started using the program in November and it seemed like by January something just clicked and she has completely kind of came out of her fog that she was in for quite a while. I have never read a documented case on any child that has not benefited anything from applied behavior analysis and uh, now with this new skills and being you know, like the E version of ABA, I can't imagine it doing anything harmful to their child. It, it's nothing but exponential growth for us. To see her now, it, is, it just blows us away I and mean, we call her our little miracle child because um, in seven months time, she has just blossomed into this normal, functioning child, and suddenly, we joke about it all the time, like suddenly we have twins. If you're even thinking about doing it, do it, because the absolute worst thing you can do is do nothing at all. 
And even if you use this program and it's just a single mom or a single dad working in the evenings with their child, this program is going to benefit them. It's it's going to show you where they are, it's going to show you where they need to go, and it's going to show you what skills and how to get there. It is an online book on how to help recover your child. Welcome back to Autism Live. Our very special guest in the studio right now, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. Welcome. Great to be here. And we should mention that you are the head of research and development here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and also the director of the Autism, or yes, Autism Research Group. Correct, yes. I can't ever get it all out in one fell swoop because it's such a mouthful. Uh, and we always like to remind people about the Autism Research Group website that they can go to and take surveys mm -hmm. to say the kinds of things that they would be interested in research being done on. That's correct. So what is that website again? It is autismresearchgroup.org. Okay. Uh, which I, I just love the idea that we can have an input uh, into what potentially gets researched. I think that's a great gift that you give all of us. Thank a, you. A voice in Thank a field you. where we don't usually get a voice. Now, I want to start with talking about the fact that you went to a conference the other day. Right. Um, this is something that you tend to do a lot of. You are out Big there. and yep. yep. And, and, and as such, you really have your finger on the pulse. So we always love to hear when you go to a conference, what was it about and what would you, what'd you come back with? All right, great. So this uh, was pretty interesting. Just got back last night uh, from Monterey, California. Mm -hmm. It was the International Meeting for um, Brain-Computer Interface Research. Wow. So this is like... 10, 20 years ahead of the curve, kind of almost sci-fi type stuff. Cool. Um, but very, very interesting stuff. This is a brain-computer interface is a whole new sort of interdisciplinary science that's emerging in the last 10 or 20 years. And it's scientists who are specifically studying the ways in which brains and computers can be connected directly. So, so computers can uh, collect data directly from your brain um, and or your brain can directly control computers. Um, that's the idea, at least, yeah. down the line. Um, so they have all kinds of crazy stuff. It's not an autism conference at all. It's a right. technology conference. Uh, but you have people from um, engineering. You have people from you know neuroscience. You have neurologists, neurosurgeons. You have psychologists. You have um, uh, you know just straight up IT people, programming people. I mean, you name it. You basically have every major discipline that would be involved in either thinking behavior or technology, right? Right. Uh, all together at the same place at the same time trying to tackle problems and trying to come up with novel solutions. Uh, so very interesting stuff. Um, and, we, I'm, and I'm just going to go out on a limb for a second and assume that there were some people on the autism spectrum who were there. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because it was technology? A bunch of geniuses? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, when they They're do those TED Talks, there, yeah. I love when they do the TED Talks and we show some of them here on the show from time to time. And whenever they make a joke about, you know, this audience will get it more than anything else talking about autism and there's that yeah. ripple of nervous laughter <laughs> yeah, that goes throughout the audience. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So, so it was exactly like that. Yeah, it was okay. a bunch of really, again, like 20 years ahead of the rest of the curve, cool. sort of like technology geniuses. Very, very cool. Um, the symposium that we put together um, was with uh, Dr. Disha Gupta, who's um, a scientist um, at Albany Medical School in New York. Uh, and she is doing research on um, EEG signals and um, autism and epilepsy and other uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and so we've been putting together a collaboration with her, basically looking at um, does behavioral intervention change uh, the way the brain functions and can we measure that through EEG yeah. signals? Uh, and that's just sort of the very first piece of the puzzle. There's um, you know lots and lots of implications for um, different applications that we might be able to develop down the road. But uh, it was exciting. So we put together a symposium. A bunch of people came, again, from different uh, disciplines, from UC San Diego, from all different places, different types of scientists, different researchers, and also um, companies that develop uh, products that measure EEG and other uh, brain measures, basically all getting together saying, how can we put this stuff together and do something important for people with autism and other developmental disorders? So it was very exciting. Cool. And was there, you know, it sounds like there was a lot of discussion about where you're going and what are you doing, but was there anything that you can tell us, because uh, I'm sure that you know much more than we all know. Did you see differences? Are you at the point where you see differences in the EEG? Uh, yeah, so our, our data are still very, very preliminary. So okay. I'm not going to, you know, and I'm a scientist, so I'm trained to be skeptical and conservative, okay. so I'm not going to let right. the cat out of the bag yet. 
All right. Uh, but so far, so good. I mean, it, it's mapping on to what we already know at CARD, which is cognitive abilities are trainable using mm -hmm. ABA procedures. So things like memory, working memory, uh, you know, self-awareness, planning, problem solving, perspective taking. These are all cognitive skills that involve behavior. They mm -hmm. involve people doing something. Um, people on the autism spectrum in general uh, have uh, deficits in these areas to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the individual, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and they're trainable. So that's basically what our research is, is showing, which we kind of already know, but now we're putting in EEG measures pre and post to show is there a difference actually in brain function when you're doing tasks of working memory before versus after behavioral intervention. So we'll see. Wow. The data aren't completely in yet, okay. but it's exciting. Very exciting. Um, some researchers from some other labs were actually showing some similar stuff where they're showing... Um, uh, working memory and divided attention and different types of attention tasks mm -hmm. um, are, of course, trainable in people with autism, which we know, and that's very exciting. Yeah. Although there's actually very little research showing that, but we know we've been doing yes. that here at CARD for a long time. Um, but now, actually, um, they were showing changes in some EEG measures and, and basically showing that the brain is actually now doing something a little bit different uh, because of or after uh, behavioral intervention. So, wow. very exciting stuff. Very cool. Um, just to sort of give your viewers a taste of the sort of more sci fi end, they had. Yeah. Um, some companies are developing some like consumer products and toys that you actually control with your mind. Uh, Love so it. There's one. It's uh, it's by a company called um, Puzzle Box, and uh -huh. it's a helicopter. You know, one of those little indoor helicopters. Uh -huh. It's like that, but you fly it with a headset that has an electrode attached to your forehead. And, and another one uh, clipped under your ear, and basically you just think about the helicopter flying, cool. and you focus, and it actually makes it fly. So Very cool. the, the motor, the electric motor that controls the helicopter, is controlled by your um, EEG signals, brain waves from one particular electrode attached to your forehead. So wow. very interesting stuff. Jem has a toy that was really popular a couple of years ago that's the Jedi mind control thing where you try to make the ball yeah, exactly. levitate. Yeah. And then idea. there's the mind flex one where you have to make it go through the... Right. Same idea, exactly. So, so that's all just kind of a gimmick, and it's just kind of fun. You okay, because I was going to say it's not it. really real that the toy is it or is it? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's real in the sense of it's not your mind; it's your EEG waves. Okay. You know, it's your brain waves that are controlling it, right. and and your behavior of focusing and thinking and mm -hmm. relaxing does indeed affect your brain waves that okay. the EEG electrodes are picking up on. Okay. So, yeah, it's real, um, but it's it's, it's nothing really um, that brilliant. It basically shows that you can, um, you know, alter your own brain waves through okay. relaxation and through focus. Uh, but those are behaviors that are trainable, right? right. So that's kind of interesting. But here's the exciting part is there's research that's starting to come out that shows things like this, like... Um, uh, one, one of the studies that we looked at in our symposium uh, was um, teaching uh, Chinese language to people who are, don't know the Chinese language. So they hold up a Chinese character and they, they teach, what, what does this mean? It means the word me or it means you or this or that or whatever. Okay? So they're doing flashcards, training, training, training. And in real time, they're also taking EEG measures. And what they're showing is now, based on the EEG measures, they can actually identify when the person is going to get a correct answer. Wow. So they can, right? So they hold up the card, and before the person even says the correct answer, they can see it in their EEG waves that, yeah, they're going to get it right. He, know, he knows it. Wow. So now they can kind of detect knowing through EEG, maybe, right? right. So it's all very preliminary stuff. But um, there's lots of implications. So take this out 10 or 20 years, and what I'm hoping we can develop is something that um, um, helps people who simply aren't going to develop vocal speech, right. helps them communicate more effectively. Right. So we know we can do PECs, we know we can do sign language, we know we can do VOCAs or voice output communication devices where you touch the computer and it talks for you. Uh, but what if the computer was able to detect directly from your brain activity what you wanted? or how you felt, right? Whether you were angry or frustrated or sad or tired. Or, um, or you know, what you were thinking about, right? So who knows? We don't know that that's even wow. possible. But based on the preliminary data that exists so far, it seems that it's possible, at least in principle. Whether yeah. it would actually be practical, whether it would actually be cost-effective, um, who knows? Right. But, it seems like we're going in that direction. Well, we've seen with some of the uh, soldiers that they're doing the prosthetic things with that mm -hmm. they can fit on a prosthetic and they can 
think and move a muscle at the yeah. end of uh, you know their their stump, and it, yeah. they can move fingers. Those guys, those uh, people doing similar stuff, were there at this conference, and so they had cool. a device that was um, basically electrodes that attached to your forearm, and then um, a headset that was maybe four or eight electrodes or so, basically an EEG headset, uh -huh. but one that's easy to put on and doesn't require gel and all that stuff. And basically, um, it was for people whose forearm muscles are paralyzed, so they can't they can't grasp their hands. Wow. But with electrodes, by sending an electrical charge through the muscle, you can cause the muscle to contract, right, wow. through electricity. Um, but now what they did was attach those electrodes to the electrodes on your head, and so just through thinking about contracting your arm, you can make your arm, your hand wow. grasp. So the idea is someone who's paralyzed will, will actually now be able to pick things up, maybe. Right. And again, this is just the initial proof of concept. Right. They're nowhere near the actual product to fix people yet, um, but there's but a lot cool. of potential. It's very, it's very cool. Very cool. Science fiction type stuff. It's very exciting. Very, very fun. Yeah. It sounds very exciting. Well, we look forward to seeing all these things in the future. 20 years, you think? Well, hopefully not that long. Hopefully but yeah, long. I mean, a lot of this science, you know, if you watch the Jetsons or something like that, you right. know, we're not, we're not driving flying cars yet, so. <laughs> no, we're not. Or having them fold up into a suitcase. Right. That's what right. I want. <laughs> right. We're nowhere near the robot nanny yet or the robot house cleaner. We've got those little Roombas, you know, that go yeah. around. Yes. Vacuum, but they're not, yes. not, not quite, quite the same, the same thing. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Although I love the fact I hadn't realized it because I'm a big Star Trek geek, and uh, Jean Luc Picard on Star Trek Next Generation used to do all of his stuff on this flat little pad, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. now we have all there of our go. iPads and you know doing and things. Cell phones are starting to look an awful lot like Star Trek communicators. Yes, it's pretty they much are. the same thing. So now at this in point. some respects, we're getting there. All right, we're going to take a break and come back and have Dr. Tarbox answer some of the questions that you guys have sent in on the feature overnight, so stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas, such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step three, choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here.
Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, the Head of Research and Development at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and also the Director of the Autism Research Group. So uh, we had a question that came in for you last week just as you were leaving. Hi, Dr. Tarbox. Should I be correcting my son's speech verbally? I sometimes feel that I am correcting too, too much. Is there a visual way to help him stop making the same grammar mistakes, i.e. using pronouns the wrong way? I want so much for him to be successful in his speech he's in third grade. I, I'm right with you on this and I'm glad you're asking this question because I would like to know my son has corrected a lot of his speech things but he is still saying I seen it mm-hmm. and it makes me want to run into traffic <laughs> with my hair on fire and I, I'm always saying you have to put an I've seen it or, or say I saw it and you know and I correct him and he says okay um, but he's not getting to the point where I don't have to prompt him and it really infuriates me and I think yeah. now it infuriates me to the point that it infuriates him when I bring it up. Right, He's so right. excited about something and I say, you've yeah, seen yeah. it? You've seen it? It's horrifying. I can't have right. a child who says that. <laughs> right? Because that's on me, you know? Right, yeah. So help us. Save us from ourselves. Okay, so I'm really <laughs> I'm really glad that your viewer asked this question. Um, and I feel like it, it actually raises a, a very common issue that's really important um, and that comes up all the time and isn't, again, isn't just for parenting kids on the spectrum, but for all of us as parents. Um, and that is... Um, uh, using sort of consequence-based approaches or correction versus or and or using antecedent-based approaches, right, which are more preventive and teaching-based. So, um, you know, I completely sympathize with your viewer. We all correct our kids when they do something annoying or when they do the same mistake over and over, and we become frustrated, and right, and it just becomes yeah. a source of frustration for, oh, yeah. for you and your child. Um, but I guess the first thing I'd say is let's think about what the strategy is, right? So what, any, anytime we're doing anything to change our kids' behavior, we want it to be purposeful and tactical. Like we want to think, why am I doing this? What's the goal? How long is it going to take to produce that outcome, right? Um, and is this the best way to do it? So, and it sounds like that's sort of what your viewer is thinking about already, yeah. right? That's yeah. the track she's on already. Yeah. And I'd say, okay, let's think about this. So we're doing correcting. What's the point of correcting? The point of correcting is to decrease that mistake, mm-hmm. right, in the future, and to increase the proper way of speaking in the future. So. Uh, you got to ask yourself, is it working? Oh, gosh. Right. There's the key, right? Is because it my, my thing, I don't know about for the mom, but obviously, you know, if you're concerned about it, probably you're in the same boat that I am, that it's clearly not working when I'm doing it. Right. And and kind of by definition. So I want to keep doing it. Right, right. right. Well, and uh, let's not forget, kind of by definition, any parenting thing that we're doing to change our kids' behavior, if we're still doing it for a long time, it's not working. Right. It's not working. Right. Um, doesn't mean you're making the wrong decision or you're bad or you're stupid for doing that. Nothing like that. It's just, okay, it's not working. Right. So, um, uh, right. So, you know, and then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the cost of doing it this way? And, you know, I've certainly had this experience as a parent is it drives you nuts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if it's not working and it's making you frustrated and it's probably making your kid frustrated, oh, yeah. then you got to ask yourself, well, why am I really doing it? And a lot of times it comes down to exactly what you said, which is it just feels like I have to. I can't mm-hmm. let my kid do X. I have to do something about it. And the most obvious thing that we all do about something as parents is react, Mm -hmm. is be reactive. Wait till the bad thing happens and then do something about Mm -hmm. it, right? Well, okay. So we know from a lot of research um, that it's much better to be proactive than reactive. So if you really want your kid to get better at a particular language skill, the best thing you can do is set aside time to practice that particular language skill. Not when he's making a mistake, but just when you're hanging out, when you have a little bit of spare time. Say, all right, Let's practice talking about blah, 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 whatever it is. Come up with a bunch of different um, opportunities to practice it and literally practice it over and over. And provide help uh, as an antecedent, right? So provide prompting and provide help or provide rules so that your kid is successful and then reinforce it. That's right. really the, That's key, the key, right? And, and when you have a kid who's pretty high functioning, talking a lot, using pronouns, you probably think, well, that's too contrived. I don't need to do this repeated practice type thing anymore. He should be able to, he should be able to get it, right? But if you're saying someone should a lot, what that means is you're not dealing with the reality of they're not doing it, right? And so let's do something different that'll make it work better. So repeated practice, but across a lot of different examples in different situations, in different settings, and with different people, um, and lots of positive feedback and praise when he's doing it right. That's the best thing to do. Okay. And honestly, you could probably just stop correcting. 
Okay. It's not working. It's so when they make the mistake, let it go. Yeah, Focus on working. it another time. Yeah. Uh, but don't even say anything when they do it. Right. And what your viewers are probably thinking to themselves is, wait a minute, I can't just let it go. I, I'm not going to give up on this, right? Right. Well, but a much more effective way to not give up on it is to be proactive about it and set okay. aside time to practice. And like right. any other skill, if it's a challenge to learn it, you need a lot of practice. Okay. I'm going to do that this weekend. and I'm going to come back on Friday and, and talk and see how it went for me. And then hopefully you'll write in as well uh, for that parent who wrote in and we'll, yeah, we'll compare you, notes. You could literally sit down and say, like if it's, it's pat, sort of past tense, right? Mm-hmm. Stuff, you know, literally sit down and say, all right, man, let's talk about what we did yesterday or right. what you did last week and per- talk about preferred topics. Make uh-huh. it fun. Don't make it contrived and robotic. Make it natural, okay. but provide lots of opportunities. And, and before he makes a mistake, you can remind him, say, now let's not forget. Let's work on I've seen it. I've seen right? it. Or I, I saw, it. saw it. Right. right. And why not practice going back and forth and talk about why you do one or why you do the other. Okay. Lots of praise. Make it fun. Okay. I love it. Absolutely love it. We had another question that came in night before last. I have a problem with my daughter tearing up her clothes. Need help finding her things to wear and help finding out why she does it. Because uh, that, you know, it's a big concern, obviously. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. There's money involved. There's safety involved. Uh just remaining clothes in public. Exactly. Involved. Yeah, yeah, big yeah. issues there. So a lot of, uh, I imagine it brings up a lot of questions. Yeah. And, we, and I said earlier at the start of the show that we don't give child-specific advice because this is a perfect example that I, I imagine that there are lots of different circumstances that might be happening in that would lead you to say other things. So Absolutely. So the first thing is, and I know I always sound like a broken record, but the first thing is we have to know why the right. kid's doing the behavior, right? right? And in ABA terminology, the, the answer to the question why is the function, the function of the behavior, right? So is is the child doing it um, to, to get a reaction out of others, right, for attention? Are they doing it um, to escape from some other task demand? So maybe you ask her to do something she doesn't really want to do, and she starts ripping apart her clothes, and then that allows her to escape the thing she didn't want to do. Um, is she doing it, um, it could even be automatically reinforced mm-hmm. in the sense that it just, maybe the, you know, there's some sensory thing about the clothing right. that doesn't feel comfortable. Could be she's, hot. She's trying to just get yeah. it off. Yeah. Tight. Um, I mean, I've certainly worked with kids before who just genuinely didn't want to wear clothes. And that's that. I mean, that was the end. That that was the function was just having no clothing on. Right. Um, that actually probably is the hardest one to, to right. deal with successfully because, you know, um, if it's attention or if it's um, uh, it, one of those other functions, you can just withhold or give that. Right? right, as a consequence right. for either doing the behavior or not doing the behavior. Um, so if it's automatically reinforced, that's more challenging. Um, but then what you need to do is override that um, automatic reinforcement with some other kind of reinforcer that's more powerful. Okay. So you find some other reward that's more powerful than being naked <laughs> yeah. and deliver that to your child for keeping her clothes on. Yeah. Um, but the other great thing is an antecedent intervention is get clothing that's more uh, durable. Get clothing that she simply can't tear, like yeah. a thick denim or um, corduroy or something like that, almost like work clothing, you know? Right. Uh, you know. It doesn't have to look like work clothing, but you can get clothing that's that's very durable and tough, and that would be at least be a good place to start. Okay. Um, but And then I would imagine, too, Nancy and I were talking about the other day, Nancy Oswald Jackson, about the fact that Thankfully, our children are verbal enough at this point that they're starting to tell us things that that bug them that we didn't know when they were a child, and sure. they would engage in behavior that we didn't understand. Absolutely. That my son the other day, when I was helping him to cut his fingernails, and I was twisting his hand a certain way, and he said, "Mom, you have to stop holding my hand that way; it hurts." Whereas, you know, there was probably four years when he would run away from me when I was clipping his nails, right? Because right. he couldn't say that. Couldn't say. It and was she was, and Nancy was sharing that Wyatt used to always dress himself and put his T-shirt on. Uh, so that the tag was in the front because, and she just thought it was that he just, it was a 50-50 chance and he just kept getting it wrong. Right. But now she knows he's old enough that he says, I hate the tag. The tag tickles me back there. There's more space here. And you, yeah. and when I have it on backwards, you don't take the time to take it off, mom. You come along and cut it and then I'm happy both ways. <laughs> That's you know, yeah. clever. Yeah. clever guy yeah. for doing that and you know really really difficult but we do know that there's lots of sensory things as you mentioned you know sure. that while you're getting durable stuff too maybe underneath the durable stuff putting something that doesn't have a tag that's softer you know that's a great point so that would be worth taking a look at um, you know you know in ABA we're always obsessing about our data but it's something you could relatively easy do easily do is um, write down which particular items of clothing she's more likely to try to remove or tear off um, and see if there's a pattern. And what you might find is, yeah, she's she's trying to tear off clothing that's um, 
you know, har you know, harder or crispier right. or whatever. Whereas softer clothing like sweats or cotton uh -huh. t-shirts, she keeps on. Maybe not, right? Maybe there is no pattern. But at right. least if you write down systematically for a week which item she tries to tear off, then you will be able to detect if there's a pattern. And I would imagine, too, writing down time of day and how long after you put them on. Sure. You know, is there like a period of time that the, the clothing is okay and then at 1 o'clock suddenly, you Absolutely. know, the, the clothes have to come off? But the first thing really is to try to identify the function. Yeah. And so, is, you know, is looking at what is this behavior doing for her? It, is, yeah. is it allowing her to get attention or escape or, you know, um, and we've talked about this on your show many times. But. Yeah, but I, I think it's important for all of us to remember on a daily basis that there is no such thing as completely random behavior. That's right, yeah. Um, and that's still mind-boggling to me at this point in the game now where that we're... When he was little, there was just some stuff that he did that I just looked at and went, I have no idea what that is. I oh, don't sure. get it. I it's have no being idea. A <laughs> right? I have no idea what it is. And I really kind of, I guess, you know, I mean, and, and experts would talk to me about the fact that no, it has a function, but I didn't know how deep seated and logical the function was until now. Right. And I, and I am, I don't get me wrong, I'm grateful every day for the fact that he can tell me now. I didn't know if I was ever going to get to that point, but it is eye opening when he tells me. And right. when we talk to somebody like Temple Grandin and, and she says, yeah, I spun that plate on my bed an hour a day because I love to watch the way the light would hit it. And if I went fast or slow and how fascinating it was right. it just it was a, a problem that I could never get enough of right right um, you know that it wasn't just her sitting and spinning the plate right uh, fascinating well and you know the problem is uh, the traditional medical model of disease which is you have the disorder called X so why do you do the behaviors you do because you have X right right, right. Uh, and so man if you apply that to autism you're left helpless yes. there's nothing we could do about anything because he has autism oh well yes. right uh, but yeah, as you say, everything your kid does has a reason. It's not yeah. random, and it's definitely not caused by autism. Right. It's caused by them getting something they like and something right. that matters to them in life yeah. from that behavior. But I think, you know, you really have hit upon it because this, this last weekend was a very interesting weekend to me. I was at the Taco Family Picnic, mm -hmm. and boy, that's a place where you see it all. Mm -hmm. You see these little itty-bitty kids who come in who've already started treatment and are just, like, amazing and doing so well. And all up through adults on the spectrum who got sure. no intervention right. whatsoever and you see the difference in what the outcome is. It's crystal clear. You don't have to wonder. And parents are doing, you know, all manner of things and very informed. Um, and then the next day after the Taco Family Picnic, we went to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And then one of the first things that we did was we went into the Tiki Bar, uh, Bird Lounge. Mm -hmm. And my adult niece, uh, she was happy to send her child in with us, but she said, I've seen the Tiki's. I cannot handle it again. I'm going to opt out and stand by the Dole Pineapple uh, Whip uh, Cabana. You guys go on in and, and watch the birds sing. And she got into a conversation with a mom who was standing there. So they had a good 40 minutes to stand there and talk. And uh, it came up about the fact that I host this show and yada, yada, yada. And, she, and my niece mentioned that my son has autism. And the mom uh, started talking with her about it. And she said, but you know, there's all these, my niece said, there's all these things you can do though. And there are some kids who recover. And this was an adult woman who has grandchildren, many grandchildren. And she leaned forward and said, what are you talking about? How do I not know anything about this? Right. I didn't know that there was anything you could do for autism. Oh. I thought it was just a heartbreak. Yeah. And and, I, and so my niece was telling this to me, and I said, you know, it really is brought home to me on a daily basis that it's one person at a time that we have to tell. And she said, but stop and imagine. Here's a, a mom of, like, I think she had six kids, and she has double-digit uh uh, grandchildren and they're all professionals and she said hopefully she'll go and tell all of them and they'll tell people you know one of them is an orthodontist and she's like that orthodontist is going to go and tell somebody in their practice and but you would think that all these years later that people would understand that there's help and there's hope and there is treatment for autism no it's amazing how how, it's how scary. far we have to go still yes very scary. In any case, um, so m many more questions about the clothing, but, you know, take a look at all those things that Dr. Tarbox, and feel free to write back in next week if you uh, have more information to share with what whatever it is that you've tried. I want us to take a short break, and then we're going to come back and look at some of the concerns that you guys wrote in on Facebook skills and see if we can get Dr. Tarbox to weigh in a little bit on, on your concerns. So stick with us. 
the Center for Autism and Related Disorders is celebrating the grand opening of the Card Assessment Center in Woodland Hills. The Card Assessment Center provides consultation and assessment for individuals of all ages with a variety of disorders, including autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit disorder, memory disorder, learning disability, and intellectual giftedness. To schedule an appointment, contact the Card Assessment Center today. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're looking at Facebook right now to see some of the comments that you guys have written into the show. Our question today was what what concerns do you have about your child's current play skills? So uh, we had two different moms who wrote in and said they just don't play at all. And one of the different moms, because it's somebody that I, I know, um, it's an older child, okay. somebody who's 16 years of age. I don't know for the other one. Uh, and one is a girl and the other one is clearly a boy. Um, and and I, we know that this is a problem for a lot of our kids. Sure, absolutely. But I imagine you deal with it, maybe not, uh, different if they're young younger or older. Absolutely, so let's yeah. start with a 16 year old who okay. doesn't engage in play. What sure, would you do? Sure. Well, first of all, I'd say I'm not really an expert, like uh, adolescence is not really my area of expertise in right. autism, but I, I should be able to give some general tips. Okay. Um, one is it's real easy for us to forget that the age of the person matters a lot and, you know, take a look at typically developing 16 year olds and see what they do. They don't do a lot of playing anymore really. Um, you hope that they have some leisure skills. Uh, maybe they're out riding a bike, maybe they're out skateboarding, probably they're sitting around looking at Facebook and playing video games with their friends, right. um, probably gossiping, walking around together, you know. Um, so I'm not sure really what play skills are reasonable to expect really right. for a 16 year old. Um, uh, but the bottom line is, I think what your viewer is asking is, how can I give her uh, some meaningful leisure activities, something to do in her spare time that's productive, right, non-destructive? Um, and I guess the main thing to keep in mind is leisure skills or play skills or whatever we're talking about here. Um, I'm going to have you pause for one second. Sure. We've lost your mic. If you oh. can clip your mic back up there. I can try. Uh, <laughs> I can reach over and do that for you. There we go. That? Now that you're work? much better. I'm All sorry. Right. Go right, right ahead. Right. Okay. So leisure, uh, anytime we're talking leisure skills, the whole point is they need to be sources of automatic reinforcement. They need to be um, self-reinforcing, right, or intrinsically motivating. Okay. Um, if they're not, why would we do it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you and I go and engage in a leisure skill, we're not doing it to get reinforcement from someone else, right? right? We're doing it because it's fun, because right. we enjoy doing it. Um, so same thing for a 16-year-old kid on the spectrum. Uh, what you need to be targeting is um, leisure skills or play skills that will eventually result in its own satisfaction, right? right? Producing their own fun, essentially, or yeah. satisfaction. So, um, however, a lot of folks on the spectrum don't necessarily have those skills yet, so they might need to be directly taught, right? Yeah. Um, and once the skills are acquired, then the child or the adolescent learns how to actually enjoy it and have fun doing okay. it. Um, so it could be um, internet skills, for example, doing a Google search, a simple mm -hmm. Google search, I'm not sure, um, what the verbal uh, functioning level of this individual is or if she has any typing skills or any of that. Um, but that is something that can be directly trained. If you want, okay. if you, you know, looking at videos on the internet is something that 16 year olds do yes, <laughs> a lot, they do. right? And that's perfectly fine as long yeah. as they're appropriate, right? Not, right. not inappropriate or uh, uh, anything like that. And so uh, Google searches are something that can be teachable. Okay. Um, listening to music is another one. Yeah. Um, uh, how to operate an MP3 player or um, a CD player. I don't know if right. I, anyone even has those anymore. Yeah. Uh, um, those skills are teachable, you know, and so it's not a matter of just hand over the adolescent. Here, take the iPod, you'll like it. it right. You know, she might need to be directly taught how to scroll through the different songs and how to choose right. songs that she likes. Um, you know, gross motor activities like riding a bike or a skateboard might be something that's trainable. Okay. Um, it, it, well, it is something that's teachable. Right. Um, whether or not it's a good choice for your individual child and whether or not they have the prerequisite motor skills is a different story, but that might be an option. I'm thinking about 16-year-old girls, too, and thinking that a lot of it has to do with, oddly enough, adaptive skills that mm -hmm. are, you know, doing your nails and doing your hair and putting yeah. on makeup and those kinds of things. Here which... ends my expertise. <laughs> Well, trust me, I don't have big expertise in this area either. But, you know, that that could be, you know, maybe it's time for mom and daughter to go off to the beauty parlor and, okay. and get the mani-pedi. And, um, you know, that that's something, if there's an interest there, mm -hmm. um, that that's 
And I imagine, too, when I think about it and think, well, you know, at 16, they start to go off to the prom and they go to the, they go to the beauty parlor to do that. But before that, the 12-year-old girls like to sit around and play beauty parlor. Right, right. So mom and daughter could sit and play beauty parlor at home mm -hmm. and give each other manicures and pedicures and do hair and whatever and then work up to, because it's an expense to go to a mm -hmm. salon. Mm -hmm. um, but, and also what you mentioned watching videos that seems to be a big thing with the teenagers that just go it to really the movies is. Yeah. Uh, and, and being on the computer and shopping for 16 year old girls is the other thing that comes to mind for mm -hmm. me that mm -hmm. um, so seeing and, and you can shop online and you can shop at the mall mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, very interesting yeah interesting the whole 16 stuff. year old girl thing is difficult for everyone it's, right, I think that's it's true. like aliens coming from another <laughs> planet it really is and I used to be a 16 year old girl so I can say that uh, it just is a different thing, yeah. um, and it, and fortunately that period of time doesn't stay long. We grow up into women. Sometimes we're still interested in a lot of those things. We're still we're still like aliens from <laughs> other planets from time to time. But uh, yeah, exciting to think about. I hadn't really thought about the fact that the what how they play at that age vastly vastly different. Very very different. And but whatever it is, whatever your goal is, or whatever your expectations are for your adolescent on the spectrum, for play skills or leisure skills, it needs to be something they're eventually going to actually enjoy. Yeah. And that may well need to be taught. Though they may well need to be taught how to do the activity so that it does produce enjoyment right. for them. Absolutely. And then for younger kids who aren't engaging in any play whatsoever, right. what advice would you give to parents? Right. So this is real common, right? Almost yeah. every, honestly, almost every child who's significantly affected by autism uh, on the spectrum that, that we get through our doors needs to be taught some play skills. Yeah. Um, that's, it's just a very, very common need. Yeah. Um, and and uh, for, unfortunately, at first, almost by definition, if your child isn't playing, that means they don't think playing appropriately is fun. Yeah. Right? Playing is supposed to be fun. So uh, if it's not fun, that means they're not going to just do it. You can't just give them the toys and have them right. do it. And so it does need to be directly taught. Yeah. How do we teach in ABA? We teach through repeated practice, lots and lots of help, powerful reinforcers, and fading out the prompts, right? right. And not just doing the same thing over and over. We're not talking about rote repetition, right. but... Um, you know, uh, so something like functional pretend play, a real early skill would be uh, get multiple different toys that, um, you know, let's say vehicles, like a train and a truck mm -hmm. and a motorcycle, an airplane or something like that. Right. And we literally physically prompt the child to uh, do what they're supposed to do with a toy and maybe uh, vocalize the sound effects if they have the vocal mm -hmm. abilities. And at first, we need to use physical prompts mm -hmm. and contrived reinforcement. And by contrived reinforcement, I mean whatever reward is actually motivating to the child. Right. And so at first, it might be completely unrelated to the playing, like, you know, I mean, the worst case scenario, like an M&M, something right, like that. Right. Or it might be a cracker, or it might be just pats on the backs and hugs and tickles, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but it needs to be motivating uh, to that individual child. And it doesn't necessarily need to be functionally related to that play skill, right? right? It can be something totally arbitrary, as long as it's a powerful reward. Now, here's the cool part. By pairing playing with toys over and over and over with powerful reinforcers, uh, it does two things. One, it teaches the child how to engage with the toy in a way that's actually fun mm -hmm. so that it produces its own fun, but also it conditions that toy to be more fun right. because anything that we do that's paired with lots and lots of powerful rewards itself becomes more rewarding. Right. And so what we see all the time, it's not magic, it's commonplace in, in good quality ABA programs, is we see kids who at first had to be prompted a lot and re receive lots of practice to play and get lots of big rewards. Then, let's say six months or a year later, they love those toys. Right. And now those toys that they once had no interest in at all, now those toys are the rewards right. for doing other stuff, right? So cool. Which is very, very exciting. And so just to go over that condition reinforcer, and you brought up worst case scenario in m and right? Let's just go to the worst case scenario. That's okay. not reinforcing to everybody, and it isn't the biggest reinforcer to everybody, but let's say that that's what your child loves, okay. M&Ms. And even, you know, if you're careful or you have a pill cutter, you can cut M&Ms in half if you want okay. to reduce the sugar. So, let's say that you were going to teach... Um, uh, Jesus to, to play with the cars and so he plays with the cars and so you give him a piece of an M&M and right. you give him praise and go that's great here's your M&M good playing whatever and then over time then you, you want to fade that out yeah as, as he starts to play with the train or the truck or whatever it is independently then you gradually fade out how much you're rewarding the behavior and you gradually fade out how much you're physically prompting and reminding him to do the behavior and as you see him start to just play with the truck when he sees the truck right, right. 
Uh, that's when you know, okay, great. It's actually starting to become its own right. source of enjoyment, and right. then you really back off on the reinforcement right. and on the prompting. So we're not talking about a child who every time he plays with a truck, you know, six weeks later is getting an M&M M&M for right. it. I no. just think that that's no. important. Because it seems crazy. It does In your head, yeah, it, seems it seems like crazy. I'm going to give him an M&M &M for playing, but very quickly then it does work. Right. Where he's playing and he sees how much fun play is once he knows how to do it. And the reason why it seems crazy is because in our culture we're hung up on this idea that playing should be rewarding. Right. right? And so, and now remember, in ABA, anytime you're using the word should, right. it's a red flag. Right. So if you're saying my kid should X, Y, and Z, right. well, how, where's should getting you? Yeah. Right? Let's, let's so, look at reality. Yeah. If you want it to actually work, then you got to do what works. And right. the thing is, is playing isn't rewarding sometimes, or particular yeah. toys just aren't rewarding for a lot of kids on the spectrum. But we can get them to be rewarding, and then that's when you know you've really done your job. I always do the example of Angry Birds. Like, if Angry Birds, people are addicted to Angry Birds. They just love it. My son and my husband will play Angry Birds all day. They just love it. To me, it's work. I go, this is supposed to be fun. It is work to me. I don't right. get it. It's not reinforcing to me. And and that reminds me that stuff that I think is cool and is really fun. I love to play Oregon Trail. Here I am admitting my guilty pleasures. Wow. Oregon Trail is ridiculous. <laughs> I worry about, you know, I'll be at the grocery store and I'm like, I have to go home and harvest my virtual porn. That's crazy. That makes no sense whatsoever. And my husband goes, how, how on earth is this exciting to you? Right, but each person is an individual. Each person is an individual. And let's not forget things that you may not be that interested in. If you do them in a context with other things that you really care about a lot, you'll start to like it more. So yes. like, let's say Angry Birds, if that was the only... Uh, free time that you got with your kids and your husband, let's say, would you would start to like, like it. it. I would start to like it. You're right. I would. There's a way to make that, but we don't want Angry Birds to be reinforcing <laughs> to me. Let's not go there. I have enough problems with uh, Oregon Trail right now. Okay, so uh, another person, uh, actually a couple of people have written in about their children's play skills and different reasons that set them off, but the children will engage in aggression. Uh, okay. One person who says sometimes he gets annoyed and even angry if they will not do what he wants to. Sure. That's if he decides to play at all. Another person who says they get nervous around the other kids and if they get too close or even look at him, he pinches and bites so mm -hmm. that there can be some aggression uh, that comes along with play. Sure, so, absolutely. Totally different circumstances, right. uh, but we see aggression. Well, and actually, in some, in some respects, there's some similarity to what we were just okay. talking about, and that is you know, why do you think a kid would be engaging in aggression when another kid approaches them? It's probably not because they want to play with that kid, right? right? Uh, it could be, it's possible, but not very likely. Because right. what usually happens when, when you're playing around another kid, you're a child, and you aggress towards that child, what usually happens? An adult runs over and says, don't do that, right. and then says, you guys play separately, right? right? You guys just, you take it easy over there, you take it easy yeah. over here. And why do you do that? To keep the kids safe. Perfectly right. reasonable, right? right. But if the reason why the kid's aggressing is because he wants to be left alone, you've just reinforced the behavior. Right. So you've just taught him anytime you want to play by yourself, no problem. Just hit the kid and yes. you get what you want, right? Yes. Um, and it's a natural thing to do as parents and as teachers, but we have to be um, mindful of what, uh, what the yeah. consequences are that we're giving to those behaviors. Um, so really, anytime a kid is engaging in any kind of severe behavior like pinching, biting, hitting, kicking, scratching, whatever, um, we need to go back to the idea of behavior function and behavior intervention plan. Mm -hmm. So this kid is going to need a behavior intervention plan that specifies how to prevent the behavior, right, mm -hmm. from occurring to begin with, um, and how to respond to the behavior if and when it does occur. And there aren't going to be any general tips. It's going to depend on the individual kid and the individual behavior and why that kid is doing the behavior. Is yeah. it to escape from the kids? Is it to get attention from, from the teacher or the parents? Is it to get a toy from the kid? Or is it to prevent the other kid from stealing your toy? Toy, right? All of these things are different reasons why the behavior could right. occur, and what you do to fix that behavior is going to be different for okay. all of those reasons. So it always comes back to what, what's the paycheck That's for right. this behavior. That's right. And the way that we find that out is by asking for an FBA. Yeah, a functional assessment or functional behavioral assessment. Yep. And who can we ask to do an FBA? Uh, well, someone who's an expert in doing FBAs. Uh, <laughs> usually, right? uh, usually uh, or oftentimes that person will be a board certified behavior analyst, right. a BCBA. Um, there are people who know how to do FBAs 
that are not BCBAs, and there certainly are BCBAs who are not experts in doing FBAs with okay. kids with autism, but it's a good place to start. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, this person should have a few years of experience providing function-based behavioral interventions to children with autism and conducting functional behavioral assessments. So if they don't have that experience, they're not an expert yet. Okay, so I'm always trying to save a buck and do things efficiently, but if you're, so let's say that your child is engaging in this behavior at home, but they're also engaging in this behavior at school. Right. My uh, first go-to, and tell me if I'm in left field, would be ask the school to Absolutely. perform an FBA because Absolutely. then they're going to pick up the tab on that. Right. Well, and it's their responsibility to do that. Right. I mean, if that destructive behavior is happening at school, it's putting the child at risk and it's putting other children at risk, right. and it's the school's responsibility to do something about that. And the only responsible, evidence-based thing to do about that is a functional behavioral assessment. And even even if the child is doing it during recess, that is still under their Absolutely. their domain. Ask them to do the FBA, and they should. At most schools, they should have somebody who is trained who can do an FBA. But right. use and that language. They, and, Put it in writing. And if they don't have someone who's an expert, then they need to hire someone who's an expert. Right. And also, don't let anyone tell you to put your kid on medication as a first first line, you know, uh, right. reaction to the behavior. You'll oftentimes hear that, and especially from school staff, where it is not their job to do that, to right. tell you that. And frankly, it's not even their discipline. They're not experts in medication. Right. And what you'll often hear is, oh, he has a lot of issues. He has a lot of anger problems. Have you ever thought about medication? Yeah. And that's absolutely not the first line treatment. There is a place for medication right. for management of challenging behavior, but it's a last resort. It's not the first thing or even the second or fifth thing that should be done. Okay. Really, I, I'm glad that you brought that up. And then it's possible that they could do the FBA at school and discover what the function of the, that is and put a behavior intervention in, in place and discover that the function at home is something different. That's correct. Yeah. Um, or it could be that your child is just engaging in this behavior at home or when they're on your time, not school time. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you, you can go to BACB.com to mm -hmm. look for a BCBA. That's right. They have a, a list of all BCBAs in the world, uh, sortable by zip code or state or mm -hmm. country that you live in. But if you're already receiving ABA services, you would go to your service provider and Absolutely. say, this is what's happening. Can we do an FBA on That's this? Right. And, in, and, and come up with a behavior intervention plan for That's this. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and I would also tell you that once you get that function of the behavior um, from your BCBA, there is a wonderful behavior intervention plan builder on skills that I uh, just love. But um, I'm glad you love it. I do. I absolutely love it. And I would say to you, too, that if you have the school do an FBA and they say, okay, well, we found out the function of this was this and here's our intervention plan, take that function of that behavior, go back to your skills account, plug it into your skills sure. account, and then go down and ch with their BIP in your hand and check what take it says look, on yeah, skills sure. because skills is all evidence-based. It's right. research-based. And it's least intrusive. And I have done that before with a BIP that was given to me by the school and went, mm -mm, this intervention is not shown to be effective with this behavior. I'm sorry, guys, kicking it back to you. Here's what I want you to do instead. And they went, okay. <laughs> and it was a happy, happy, happy moment. Great. So it's another resource. I could have wasted a year doing their intervention, which was based on I don't know what. Right. Instead of, uh, so, and it empowered me in the moment because I don't, I don't know. <laughs> You know, but I was able to plug it in. It took me 15 minutes on skills to go, this intervention is not what I want done for my child. This is the one I want done. Great. I'm glad you uh, liked it. It was my team that developed it. I don't know if we were well, talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do. I love it because it's just another one, another set of tools that you give a parent that I, because I, Otherwise, do you know what I used to do before an IEP to get ready? I would spend maybe six weeks and read books and be looking up standards in right. other states to figure right. out and looking at my son to figure out what is right for right. him goal-wise right now so that I didn't go into the meeting and just feel like they gave me goals and I don't know whether they apply to my child or not. Right, and or this as a intervention. Parent, you spend all of your time oh. now on the internet just desperately sorting through a million different things and you have no way of knowing what's actually is it, right. Is right. it age-appropriate for right. him? I mean, once upon a time I got an IEP that had an age-appropriate goal for my child when he was way too young that they wanted him to attend to something for 30 minutes. And I don't remember whether it was kindergarten or first grade and fortunately <laughs> for me one of the officials who was on the IEP uh, team said, this is not an appropriate goal. This is way too long of a time yeah. for a neurotypical child. We wouldn't expect <laughs> of anyone coming in. And I remember thinking, I should have known that. I don't know how I should have known it. But as a parent, you feel like you have all this yeah. responsibility. But 
honestly, that, that BIP builder, man, being able to compare it was so empowering for me as a parent. And I think people could take a look at that for, there's some kind of free trial or something like that, right? Even if they're not a skills member, they can test it out. Absolutely. There's a 14 day free trial that they can go and check that out. Um, And, you know, I think the the biggest issue that I say with skills all the time is that there are so many things that you can use. It's like going to Disneyland. You're not going to get it all in one day. That's true. You're not Um, going to get it all in two weeks. Right. You're not going to get it all in two weeks, but to go and get a little flavor of, and then when parents call in and say, okay, I'm not sure how to use this. I say, what's first on your priority list? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to decrease behaviors, build skills? You want to get your IEP ready because you can use, you want to get a a picture of where your child is right now to know how much, you know, time you need to put in and where, where you guys are right now. What's, what's the thing today? Cause it has all of these things for you, but you're not going to be able to use them all at the fullest today. Right. Um, so the biggest issue is it, it does way too much, <laughs> right? I that mean, what a, what a great quality problem for all of us. In any case, uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time. We had like one more comment on that, but we're pretty much out of time. But I have to thank you for all the work that you do. My pleasure. Thank you for coming and sharing with us it's all these fun. wonderful things. But thank you for the work that you do because you're, you're a busy man doing great things, far-reaching things that, that trickle down to all of our kids, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Because uh, my kid is one of the ones who's been benefited and continues to benefit from it. You're a stand-up guy. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Um, but I also want to remind everybody that next week we're going to be doing four live shows. We're not doing a live show on Thursday, but we will be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then we will be taking at least a week and a half break. It's looking more like it might actually be two weeks because uh, I'm out of here. Uh, but I'm going to send, I think I'm going to send some little v- video bloggy things as Gem and I drive back. We're going to drive back from Iowa on our oh, own wow. little adventure. That's exciting and stop and see some things on the prairie. So I might uh, post some video blogs. But I want you to know that the conversation continues and our crew is going to be out filming a lot of things uh, during that hiatus that we're gone. And we're we're actually doing a little bit of regrouping programming-wise. So now more than ever, we want to hear from you guys about what you want us to be covering on the show. I mentioned yesterday there are a couple of specific topics that you guys have written in on. Um, I mentioned that we want to do a segment on older moms. We want to do a segment on siblings. You guys want to know about music um, and you want to know a little bit more about some biomedical stuff. But what else do you want to know about because we're planning our experts way in advance. So I hope that you will write in and tell us. Emily just showed you some of the different ways that you can get in touch with us. And of course our Facebook will stay active. The question feature will stay active while we are away as well. Next week, a very exciting week with a bunch of uh, powerful guests. We have Dr. Uh, Tarbox is joining us next week, yes? yes. Next Friday. Yep. And also, Dr. Doreen Grampache will be here on Wednesday taking your questions for Ask Dr. Doreen. So I hope that then there will be a little bit of a break for that. So I hope that you'll be writing in uh, over the weekend and letting us know what kinds of things you want Dr. Grampache to talk about on Wednesday. We'll be back on Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.